kind of two main themes going on, looking at how property rights relate to economics and economic efficiency, and another theme about um, how property rights relate to conservation of the environment. So there are these two seminal texts that come up, and the main point that they bring up uh, is the private property rights align incentives so that we maximize economic efficiency and we protect the environment. So this is about 45 years ago, and then since then there's been whole bodies of literature kind of dealing with these particular postulates, but that's kind of been the undercurrent uh, thread throughout all of these. Um, so what I'm going to attempt to do today is kind of use that as my jumping off point and synthesize a bunch of the new information that we have about property rights that have come up over the next, uh, over the last uh, 45 years. But to start off, I want to be clear about my biases. So let's just read these out just so everybody's clear where I'm coming from. I am saying that the economy is constrained by Earth's biophysical uh, capacity uh, and related that economic activity should not critically degrade natural capital stocks. Um, I'm putting out there that resilient ecosystems are important inherently and that rights by definition reflect human interrelationships. We can get into that at the end uh, about the implication there. And then also that future generations do have some claim to uh, our current resources. So if you disagree with any of these particular postulates, just keep that in mind as I go forward. Hopefully you don't disagree too much with this. Um, so what I'd like to do is start with the conclusion for folks that have to jump out early um, <laughs> or get bored during the course of this. Um, yes, that line is supposed to be there. I'll get to it in a second. So the main part of this talk is actually using that as a, a jumping off point that regarding common pool resources that human activity as it approaches ecological limits that common property rights actually naturally have to emerge in order to protect those particular resources. And so why is this weird vertical line sitting right there? So the theory that I talked about these kind of like 45 years ago, this growth of property rights theory, is represented in everything up until the line. So uh, a lot of what is talked about, there's debates about it, but the general trend is, is that what you have in an op open access regime is that there's no property rights that basically anybody can use resources however they see fit, and there's no way to really enforce that. Um, and that those work for a certain amount of time, but then once you start to scale up, that there's limitations to how much economic activity can go on right there. And so then groups will start to form into um, collectives or cooperatives, just kind of get joint ownership and create rules and norms on how to manage particular resources. And then uh, public regimes, we often refer to the state and their kind of monopoly power, uh, monopoly over uh, enforcement mechanisms and military might. And so then there's like increased efficiency. But the general trend is that private property rights specifically are what maximize economic efficiency. Um, and so then what uh, there's a, a, a lot of the literature kind of goes at little questions about right now, private property rights and open access regimes are always kind of a give and take. They're balancing back and forth. People are claiming new rights. Um, and whether or not commons necessarily, whether this is linear or not, all that's in the literature. But the more important thing is to look at the very far right side um, and looking at common assets as emerging after private property rights regimes have already been in place as those societies come up against ecological limits. That blue line is an ecological threshold. I will entertain a question for clarification first. Right, clarification. <laughs> you have common over here and you have common over there. I'm not sure I understand. Why is so um, if we want to take a look right here, I'm going to block this part. Uh, this is the traditional economic uh, property rights literature, which talks about common, uh, common property rights regimes in the context of this flow as like, less efficient than property rights. So what I'm saying is that leaving this as it is, and then we, societies may go through common property rights regimes on their way to private properties, but regardless of how they get here, once private property rights are in place, we run up on uh, limits. So that's historical. Are. Yes. And you're, I mean, I guess you're, the idea too is that as we reach a full planet, there's different types of problems we need to solve, new types of scarcity that require common. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into yeah. those particulars. What are you measuring in calling economic efficiency that shows up there? There's, these are, don't think of these as numbers. This is the general trend in the, the theoretical literature as like a spectrum. So this is my representation of a spectrum, which is like that as you change from open access towards private property rights regimes, that you increase economic efficiency. That's the Okay, so it's trend. just like a very theoretical Yes. Take. Don't think of these as numbers. That's why there's no numbers. Over here. According to the literature. According to the literature. Yes, Bob. Uh, maybe I don't have the definitions down, but I think that the open range versus the uh, closed range. In other words, private, it seems to me private should be farther to the left, 
That's the frontier. That's the six gun west. And then came public and, and so on. Why is private the ultimate limit? So the, what I'd love you to do is to say that because this is a representation of what the literature actually says right now. And the theory is, is that private property is an evolution of rights that maximize efficiency over time. And so we can get at your question, but I'd like to get through some of the nuances of what property rights we're talking about. Does that work? All right, cool. So that's where we want to go right now. What are property rights? So one common definition, which is this guy who's Ironically, his last name is Cummings. Um, <laughs> is, uh, property rights is an enforceable authority to undertake particular actions in a specific domain. So what does that actually mean? Um, and so what I'd like to do is kind of start with a little example in my hybrid uh, presentation here. For example, my laptop. This is not actually a picture of my laptop, but it was the one I found on the internet. Um, so oftentimes a commodity or a specific um, good is looked at as property. So this is my laptop and it's mine. But then we have to start asking questions. I want to push this a little bit further. Is this actually my property? What is actually the property that I have? So if I have this laptop and I bought it and everybody knows that I bought it, so it's mine. But then I leave the room. Is this still my property? Depends where you live. Well, <laughs> exactly. Um, so if I loan this to Eric and say, all right, Eric, you can use this for an hour and I leave, is it still mine? And so that's the question I want to really push, and this gets to this question between what is possession and what is property. A possession is actually having a particular object and having control over that object at a particular point in time. A prop property actually refers to the benefit streams from that particular object. So I can do different things with this computer. I could, if I thought that it was useful, I could type a paper on it, I could play music, I could throw it out the window. It, it, these are all kind of involved in like, what are my rights with this particular uh, benefit stream. But a property right is actually a relationship. It's a social relationship. So property right it shouldn't be thought of as my relationship with this particular computer. It's actually three different parties that are at play here. It's my relationship to the benefit streams of that computer in relationship to everybody else's relationship to that particular computer. When I have a property right, that corresponds with the rest of society's duties to respect that right. Otherwise, we're not talking about a situation of actual rights. Um, there's a fourth part of this equation, however, which is the actual enforcement mechanism. Now, enforcement mechanism isn't necessarily the state, don't think of something very particular, about, but norms and customs can make up that enforcement mechanism. Those are the things that keep you from taking my computer when I leave the room. Um, those can sometimes get codified into laws, but we think about the, all four of these uh, relationships, at, all four of these as parts of this property uh, rights picture. But a computer is an oversimplified example. So we're going to take it a little bit and we're going to turn towards uh, towards uh, groundwater, which is going to be an important um, component theme for the rest of this. Um, so this is the exact same thing you just saw, which is relationships to with respect to water. And what I've overlaid it is Eleanor Ostrom and uh, Adela Schlager came up with five particular property rights bundles that are associated with common property, common pool resources. Um, and so what we have here um, on the bottom are basically operational rights, which is like with respect to that groundwater, how am I allowed to use it, how much am I allowed to withdraw, that kind of thing. And the top three relate to the d being able to make decisions about whether or not to exclude people, who's allowed to use it, um, and how the management of the resource happens. So that is your uh, primer on, uh, on property rights. But up until now, we've really just been focusing on specifically on property rights, where I have a right to a particular item, and then everybody else has a corresponding duty to respect that right. But we want to go a little bit deeper and recognize that there's other relationships with respect to resources and respect to property. Um, and I'm going to highlight the second one here, which is the concept of there being a privilege and, and uh, other people having no rights. This is your classic um, environmental pollution problem, right? So then you have, the, um, you have the river, and the question is not who has the property rights to the river. The question is who has property rights to the benefit stream of the river of a specific quality of a specific water quality that's in that river. So in a situation where there's, well, we'll use an over, overused example of a factory that's polluting a river and there's fishermen in the same area as a village downstream. So nobody owns a particular quality of water in that particular river. So the factory says, well, I need to get rid of this waste and they use the river to dump their waste in. 
This is them operating in a place of privilege, where they're actually just using the water and degrading its water quality, because the right doesn't exist to a certain level of water quality. And this corresponds to the lack of rights of the other actors, folks downstream, fishermen whose uh, fish are, are getting lost out. Privilege can also be considered presumptive rights, versus the factory owner is just saying, okay, well, uh, I have the right to pollute, um, but it's not necessarily codified, it's in the absence of rights. And this gets to what Bob was talking about, where we talk about what is an open access regime and what are clearly defined property rights, and there's a relationship between these different things. Can I ask yes, a please do. Well, it depends what the question is. You can ask it now, and I'll ask you to hold it. Depending well, on if, if you read the specific <laughs> example of GE on the Hudson, where they were dumping PCBs um, and contaminated all the Hudson River, their response was, it was legal. That's right. There was no actual property right that existed which said that you can't uh, pollute that river. Are they, now being, are they now being held liable? GE? Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm not intimately familiar with the case. Yeah, they, have to, they, have, they have to clean it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, You're saying that the other people had no right to a clean river. Therefore, they had the privilege of polluting because the rest of us exactly. had no right to a clean river. Exactly. I guess we would say no understood right, no socially understood, or no, no community wide. Yeah, so we're drawing a distinction right. between what is the recognized <coughs> property right and the duty that everybody else is respecting, and then a situation like the river, where the um, GE, for in, in this particular example, is presuming the right to pollute in the river in the absence of. And there are no laws on for customs. Yeah, that are in the exactly. Yes. Please. So you're using the concept of property right or the concept of rights as a freedom, as opposed to um, rights being made up of duties and freedoms or obligations and freedoms? Um, using the concept of rights as kind of as this correlate between the rights exist and duties exist, that like a right can't exist without the corresponding duty of other members in society. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, the overarching right made up of positive rights and negative rights? I, no, I'm not going okay. in that particular direction. Other questions? Clarification? Yes, please. Does that ever become a problem when, like, say, because, like, for most things that are property, you have to, like, purchase it? Like, if I buy a house, like, certain people couldn't afford that house? So in the case of, like, GE, wouldn't, like, GE be able to say, for say, like, buy the river where the people couldn't afford the river? Like, wouldn't they, if, like, if it was, like, buying, like, buying out, like, a certain, like, having the right to it? Yeah, and so that's that's the essence of what the property rights literature over the last 45 years talks about, which is saying what we need are clearly defined rights that people can then buy and sell. So one argument would be, yes, we need to define the rights of the river and say, okay, there's 50% uh, degraded quality of the river. It's like a right that people have, and then they can buy and sell that right to kind of make sure that the most efficient allocation happens. But the idea is that clear definition of rights is what's going to be society for. Other clarifying questions? No, okay. Seeing none, we'll move on. So um, we've talked about the concept of rights, um, uh, looking at it as the difference between uh, rights and then also privileges, but there's a question about how are rights actually protected, like we saw before, there's this um, enforcement mechanism. So one idea is that uh, a right can be protected by a property rule. A property rule is where um, a particular individual has a, um, um, has the rights to, let's say, a resource, let's say it's my property, and in order for you to infringe on that right, you have to negotiate with me ahead of time. Uh, so that's actually the property rule that protects it. The opposite, or that's not really the opposite, but corresponding would be a liability rule where you actually could violate my rights to a particular benefit stream, but then you'd have to compensate me afterwards, and that's kind of protection under a liability rule. And in economic literature, one of the big arguments is when should we do things with property rules? When should we do them with liability rules? They're not mutually exclusive. They uh, relate to each other. Um, and a lot of it comes down to uh, how, much, how much the transaction costs in any particular interaction are. And then with high transaction costs, then oftentimes it's with liability rules. But the key thing to, to think about here is that in both cases, property and liability rules, Negotiation is important. There need to be two particular act, two two parties who are part of an, uh, of an interaction, which are negotiating whether or not a rule is getting transgressed or not. In the third case, alienability rules. This is specifically defining limits by society on what you can or can't do. Traditional example is, well, we would agree that I have rights to my own labor. 
But as a society, we say, well, I don't have the right to sell myself into slavery. That's an alienability rule. It's basically like removing my ability to kind of alienate myself from my, from my labor and the fruits of my labor. We're going to put aside the argument about whether or not working for anybody else is actually a sale of one's rights to their own labor, but that's a separate discussion. Um, so, yes? Brian, that, that's kind of a complicated example for me. Can you give an example which is a little simpler? For alienability rules? Yeah. Yeah, it'll come up in about four and a half minutes. Actually, it'll be three minutes. Future generations, right now. Um, so, so how does this actually relate to future generations? Um, well, right now we're operating. We're not actually operating in the, sen in the sense of uh, rights and duties. We're operating where the current generation is presuming particular rights to qualities in the environment, and the future is actually operating in a place where they have no rights to the particular to inherit any particular quality of the environment. We can think about air. We can think about water, um, uh, and that's really, really important. Um, well, as we move forward and thinking about future generations, because the future is inherently a missing market. It doesn't exist. And there's no way that it can negotiate with the current until we do time machine stuff, which we're not doing yet. Um, and so then since the, t since the future doesn't exist and can't actually negotiate, most of economic theory is founded upon the premise that there are two entities that are entering into agreement to create a price for something because both sides are going to benefit from the exchange. That's why an, uh, they enter into that exchange. If one side can never enter the negotiations, then we have to start thinking about other ways of thinking about um, exchanges that are happening. Um, and lastly, uh, the important thing about future generations is looking at that concept of efficiency. Most of the property rights literature talks specifically about how imposing restrictions on current use is decreasing economic efficiency moving forward, and so that it actually is going to be a hindrance. But the argument is actually that you shouldn't be using the baseline of today's economic activity to compare, to compare uh, and, and then project it forward and compare it to what if we enter restrictions on economic activity and move it forward. Because today's economic activity are based on the presumptive rights of the past, where no rights existed, and so people were presuming the rights to pollute, and so therefore affected economic activity today. All right, you guys still with me? All right. Upshot. I got that one from Bob. I'd never heard that term before, but I wanted to use it because I'd never heard it before. Um, so what does all this actually mean? So in, the only way to protect the rights of future generations is to use alienability rules, which would uh, basically create specific prohibitions about current use because future generations don't exist now, they can't negotiate, and property rules and liability rules require that type of interaction in order to actually be able to be enforced. Well, what does that mean going forward? Do you guys remember in the beginning when I gave you the conclusion ahead of time and talked about how uh, private properties, when they reach the uh, extent of ecological thresholds, common property rights actually are going to emerge? I want to lead us through a little bit of a case study, and that is the case of groundwater here in Vermont. This is a very crude graphic, mainly because I'm working on my graphic skills, and uh, they're not up to snuff yet. Uh, we're going to start over here on the left. Um, and you can't really see it very well, but these are just arrows, and it's, think of it as linear over time, this being several thousand years ago leading up to the present. Um, and with respect to groundwater, groundwater was pretty much an open access regime. As small amounts of humans came by, whoever could access the groundwater, use it, do whatever they want, that was just fine. Uh, the Abenakis who, uh, Abenaki Nation, who um, lived here and was now Vermont, uh, I think around 1000 uh, BCE, um, started to develop uh, communities here and they started managing that groundwater uh, under what would be considered, as we saw before, this commons regime, where they were figuring out rules that govern the use of that groundwater over time. Fast forward a couple thousand years, enter European settlers in the early 1600s, uh, and there was a conflict between those two rights regimes where they were bringing with them a very specific uh, idea about what rights were and very much about uh, absolute property rights and very defined property rights. Um, in that conflict, they saw the common property rights regimes as illegitimate and act basically an open access regime, and so therefore what eventually emerged is this private property rights legacy, which is what moved us forward to today. Now, in the property rights literature, especially uh, with um, Demzets, they would consider this to be a growth of economic efficiency moving forward. <coughs> Starting from open access, um, where anybody was using it, and as populations increased, you looked at the need to develop norms and rules around property, and then eventually saying that, oh, well, we have a lot more people, we need to actually have private property rights, and that's going to maximize efficiency in society. But this is where th current theory brings us. 
But we want to look to the right at what happened actually in Vermont, which is in 1980, uh, early 1980s, 1985 is when the legislature actually passed the, passed the law. Um, the society started realizing that uh, private property rights were um, actually degrading the quality of groundwater in Vermont, and they were causing some various problems, specifically around quantity usage, actually. Um, as new developments uh, popped up and people were drilling wells, and uh, up until that point, if you own the land, you own the groundwater underneath. As you extracted water, um, there wasn't much of a problem. As the communities became more and more dense, um, as you pulled water out of your well, you were affecting your neighbor's well. And they noticed that they were actually decreasing efficiencies because all of these problems kept popping up. And so therefore they actually shifted that property rights designation because they said, well, we're actually running into this quagmire of everybody just pulling up water is actually making more problems down the road and we're spending all of these resources in litigation. We moved towards a correlative rights regime which said, you have the rights to the water that's underneath your property until it affects the water of your neighbor. And so then they kind of just basically think of it as an attenuated property rights. Um, and then we moved to fast forward to 2008 where th what they realized was that we still weren't actually protecting the water and there was increasing scarcity in various towns uh, in the early part of the 2000s. Um, and they started looking at, well, what is the way that we actually can guarantee um, for society that the water rights are going to be available for use for current generations? And there was increasing worry about future generations in Vermont. And so in 2008, they passed Act 199, which declared uh, groundwater to be a public trust resource. I see your hand up again here. How much of that was based on existing problems, and how much was it based on anticipation of future problems like Nestle coming in and just you know, sucking up? I won't, I water. can't detach, both of those elements are true. I won't be able to say what's more or less, but both elements were important in that, in that group. Um, but some of the big discussions at the time was this larger worldwide discussion about scarcity of water uh, into the future and the ability to actually make sure that we had um, uh, we have water supplies moving forward. All right, we're moving to the implications and the conclusions of this talk. I'm over time, but I think with all the questions, I'm actually right on time. Um, so we're going to bring it back to this discussion about efficiency concerns. The next three slides are going to very specifically deal with claims in the economic property rights literature about efficiency concerns and why property rights are the most efficient. And then it's going to be a little update or kind of a response to that um, of that particular, um, that particular claim. So first off, private property rights decrease transaction costs. Transaction costs can broadly be interpreted as three particular things. It's the cost of information in terms of being able to uh, engage in a particular exchange, the uh, cost of negotiations or contracting, um, and then also the uh, cost of enforcement after an uh, exchange is actually already made. And so the argument is that if you have private ownership, then everybody's going to know a lot about the resources that they want, and they'll be able to change really freely, and that's going to maximize efficiency um, because this decreased <coughs> transaction costs. Well, Bradley pointed out that actually, as we reach these ecological limits, individual property rights lead to increased transaction costs uh, because as you uh, give individual property rights to individual people, there's more and more people to do the negotiation, so you have increased number of what he calls them as atomistic. Uh, I forget what the noun is, but or atoms uh, that are negotiating over any particular exchange. Um, next, they claim that rights attenuation decreases economic efficiency. Most of the time, whenever you talk about, oh, well, we have to put this environmental restriction on this activity to make sure we preserve the environment, people say, well, you're taking away my property rights. And any look, any look at the uh, the lowering of property rights in any way is seen as a, uh, as economically inefficient. But uh, actually, and Bartzel comes out of the tradition of Dems that is actually looking at, that's not actually true. The important thing is clear definition of the property rights. Um, and so then regardless of whether or not an enforcement is in place, it's not whether or not the enforcement exists. It's about whether the enforcement clarifies the property rights even more than it did before, which reduces uncertainty and therefore actually uh, uh, increases the efficiency of economic exchange. Um, and then lastly, the talk about ownership, alienability rights are essential component of ownership, which is increases efficiency. Um, uh, the response right there is looking at what are we talking about with, in terms of alienability. Oftentimes, alienability is defined as, I am the sole owner and I can sell the particular thing that I have uh, control over. What, um, Ocean, what Eleanor Ocean was able to point out was that there's actually very different types of bundles of rights and that you could buy, you can have, you can 
have alienable rights to your ability to use a particular resource and buy and sell those, and that actually leads to efficiency. You don't necessarily need to be able to um, sell the resource at the end to actually achieve economic efficiency. All right, what else are they saying? Uh, so the current theory looks at that the current allocated arrangement is the most efficient, otherwise it would have changed already. So the idea being that the current set of institutions that already exist is the most efficient. This is the idea of Pareto optimality, and um, that if there's more efficient ways of, con of organizing society, those will naturally emerge. And um, Livecap and others actually did an empirical analysis of the last couple um, hundred years looking at property rights and how they evolved and said, Actually, that's not true at all. Uh, it's actually institutions and institutional arrangements that actually try to um, maintain their rights regardless of whether or not there's efficiency um, gains to be had. Um, and then lastly here, private property rights regimes naturally emerge as rational economic actors internalize externalities as they adjust to changing technologies and markets. That was a mouthful. I forgot to change that slide to shorten that little piece. But that's okay. Um, and so basically what this is saying is that um, this, is, this is the tenet of the major theory, which is that as new information arises, as we learn about new markets, new possibilities, new technologies come up, we're going to change our relationship to our, the particular items that we have control over, and we're going to seek to actually improve property rights. And the theory is that we're going to try and have private property rights in those cases. Um, and then we're just adding to that particular claim that as human activity approaches ecological development, uh, that it's, pr it's common property rights regimes that are actually going to emerge from private property regimes, not uh, the other way around. Not that private property regimes are a fate of company. Gary, again. That last claim is preposterous. The Which one? The exact opposite is true. This one here? Yeah. How, who says that? Uh, this was most of the Demsets and then the 45 years of economic... There would be like all of your classical economists say that. That's yeah. exactly the opposite of what they do. They try to externalize all of that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they never internalize So I'd like you to hold that because it gets actually right to Bob's question. Okay. So those are combined. I think we can answer them at one exact time. But I do want to just finish so we can move into full-fledged discussion where you can talk about whether or not my presentation was effective, helpful, or a waste of your time. So, um, so last few um, things here. Common property rights regimes are often called inefficient because they increase negotiating costs. Uh, there's too many managers, and so then they, probably, they always have to get together to make a decision, so that's inherently inefficient. The response, common asset trust. Wait 15 seconds, I'll explain that. Uh, State-owned regimes are inefficient because they... Uh, those, make, there's an extra those making decisions don't bear the cost of their decisions. Um, oh, that's a shame. Sorry about that mis-edit. But basically it's saying that uh, folks who are in the government are going to make decisions about a resource, but they don't actually, uh, aren't actually affected by the rules that they make, which is a perverse alignment of incentives. And once again, the solution, common as such trust. So in conclusion, I want to look, I want to actually finish with uh, the same uh, style that uh, in 1967, Harold Demzetz walked through this entire path and said at the end, well, the corporation is actually a response to these kind of multiple needs of reducing transaction costs in order to align society to maximize economic efficiency. And we're going to look instead at the common asset trust um, as a particular model that's going to deal with some of these, um, some of the points that I brought up earlier today. The first uh, item would be that it eliminates the current situation of presumptive rights over environmental quality by clearly defining what the particular rights are and placing it inside of the context of a, an ecological, uh, appropriate ecological scale. Um, second, we're reducing transaction costs through the combination of unified ownership and a small number of managers. The future generations are combined into one whole as the future generations, and they own the rights to the benefit stream of a clean environment. By by doing that, you're actually limiting the number of transactions, and then you're also representing them uh, in the current day because, as we said, the future generations don't currently exist. Um, so you have a few number of uh, a few managers of the trust now to make sure that they're stewarding the resource for the future. Um, this opens the opportunity for revenue generation with respect to that particular resource because we've actually placed property rights on it. Um, and therefore, we can kind of look at how those rights are then negotiated with other folks um, who have a duty to respect those rights, as we talked about before. Um, lastly, reducing political vulnerability and the protection of the asset. Most of the time, uh, the argument is between private rights and state rights. State rights are um, often criticized because they're uh, uh, 
vulnerable to political whims and whoever has the most influence in politics. This actually in, does the exact same thing as the state set up, but it pulls it out of that political vulnerability uh, that's in the state. And then it institutionalizes, as we said before, the rights of future generations in the law by defining those rights. So, um, thoughts. I should have just said questions, comments, critiques, criticisms. Uh, this is the end. Um, you can read that. I'm not going to read that loud. But my little prompt at the bottom there is uh, referring to some of the normative claims I made in the beginning about property rights and whether or not they're just um, relationships between people is if we start expanding our concept of rights to not just be expanded to future generations, which are also other people, but to the environment itself, can we do the same exact analysis by giving property the rights to itself uh, and then humans' relationship to those? That's it. So um, in the spirit of a tea, I'm sorry for going over, but it still gives us a half an hour for robust discussion where you can say, that's a bunch of bunk, or wow, that was insightful. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Both of those comments are welcome. Um, I was yeah. going to say, it makes me look forward to reading the paper you're yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I expect it's one that I will, for my, for my criteria for a really good grad student, mm -hmm. I learn. So I think that this will fit that criteria. Um, you didn't read the paper yet. That's yeah. not <laughs> but no, and uh, I just had a comment too about your last one. Um, you know, can we make the same argument by trying ways to include nature like yourself? So, Aldo Leopold, you know, he said, if the biota in the course of eons has built something we like but do not understand, then who would a fool would discard seemingly useless parts? Give every cog and wheel as the first precaution of uh, intelligent tinkering. Um, so I would actually argue that he says, if we like it, the criteria is, do we like it? So is it, uh, um, you know, if he was talking about anthropocentric, he's talking about not nature's right to itself, but our essentially benefits from nature. But he also points out, it doesn't matter. Because if we like it, we also have to keep every cog and wheel intact. And so I actually argued that's kind of an irrelevant question. Which one? Um, the last thing is the, the, the rights to nature. Some, some people say, the right, does nature have rights itself? Mm -hmm. Do we have to protect nature for its own sake? Or does it only matter in how it uh, you know, promotes human well-being? And I think that's a silly question. Because it's, you know, if you believe about Leopold, to promote human well-being, you've got to keep every cog and wheel intact. Which means that uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing. I think, uh, I think it's silly for a couple of reasons, too. But one is, if you look back 40 years, there was this thing about, do trees have standing? So it's not a new idea. Do trees mm -hmm. have standing in legal yeah. issues? Mm -hmm. and, and also, ultimately, it does depend what we think. Uh, there's this classic question, what's, what's a penguin worth? And an acceptable answer is, not a damn thing to me. If you're willing to accept all the consequences of what that means. So I think, ultimately, uh, human opinion drives a thing. Right on. So didn't uh, Ecuador and Bolivia uh, establish the rights of nature, which answers that question in a way? Uh, yeah. Did, did so they that's explicit rights to nature in their in their laws. Yeah, and so yeah, the idea of this question, uh, sorry, I think it actually just detracting from the rest of it is just kind of a prompt to kind of look at moving forward and looking into the future. There's increasing trends to look at should, na should nature have rights to itself. And and going back to the trust. Uh, the legal structure of the trust, which we've looked at, establishes both current and future generations as beneficiaries. And that's the legal um, reason why the trust protects their rights, is it not? And because they are designated as the beneficiaries. <clears throat> I think that's the legal uh, mechanism by which future generations uh, have their rights protected. Yeah. I think it, it gets right. I believe so. That's how it gets codified. Um, Stephen, and then Matt. So the argument from uh, Josh and Bob seems to be that uh, we don't need to look at nature's own rights because um, all that stuff sort of has an impact on the rest of us, the keeping your cogs and wheels, whatever. But um, it seems to me that what you're, you've done is you've described a a very interesting and I think useful idea, but it only in, only includes those things which human beings would consider their own particular interests. So you have to have a very broad mind to say all of nature is included in our interests. And I think it, it implies 
the last question you're asking, which is, well, okay, can we actually go a little further than the common asset trust and talk about a, nat a common heritage trust or a universal heritage trust where you're saying, okay, not only do we need to steward our assets for the benefit of future generations of humanity, but we actually need to institutionalize the value rights of life on Earth. So that it is all-encompassing and not just those narrow... I mean, you could, you could, under this model, if you exclude all those other rights, completely populate all the whole planet, turn everything into arable land, do the best job you could possibly do to maintain diversity and all the rest of it and the health of the... But you've basically taken over the world from all the other creatures. That doesn't seem like a, a, a goal that I would sign on to. I want everybody to have a place on the planet, not just us. Yeah, and that gets into like what are our particular biases when we start approaching this question. Matt, you had a question, and then Chris, and oh, the other Matt. A little comment, and then maybe a question. Um, so I like common asset trusts, but I, I still have a question of. So let's say. Let's, let's use the, the, gun, the gun kitchen, which is more of an open access. Yep. So it's, got, it's, it's not well kept. Let's say we got a common asset trust on there, though, so we actually had some enforceable rules, and then, you know, it would be kept up better. But something happens that affects everyone who is, who is within that common trust, so that the maintenance of the kitchen is no longer a priority, and that by destroying the kitchen, we could all benefit somehow we're still going to end up destroying the natural, something that the future would want to use. Where when you, when you look at like how, like the Abenaki, how they defined it, they actually made it so it was something spiritual, it was um, sacred, so that there was no opportunity ever to destroy it because it's built into their cultural society that this is, this is sacred land and it's beyond anything that we can touch or do. Where I think anytime you have a common asset trust, at some time, at some point, the stress is going to get high enough that you're going to be willing to use that resource for your own benefit. At some point, the future generation, the stress on your own self is not is going to be too high that you're going to sacrifice that future for yourself, even as a common trust. It might take longer than when you have one person doing it, but at some point, you got to have something that's set aside as sacred, like the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. We set aside that, and even then, you know, we still have people, you know, trying to attack it. Yeah, I mean, and, and you've raised a, uh, kind of a, an important point, but a classic one in terms of, like, governance and the ability for, like, future generations to undo what other generations have done. So, in, I guess in the example of the kitchen, um, a lot of the literature talks about um, whether or not, so your idea is that whether or not liquidation of the assets is an optimal strategy um, at the current time. And so one of the things I think what Gary brought up is important is that in institutionalizing a common uh, asset trust model is that preservation for current and future generations. Um, and it could actually be made, more, made stronger than that, which is that the rights of future generations kind of trump and set this particular scale and then like, current generations have the ability to use like, up into a certain constraint. Now, the, the model is taken from the idea of... Um, a, uh, a financial trust, which is a model which is developed by rich people to make sure that their uh, heirs didn't squander the goods of, that they accumulated over their time. Um, right, so then the idea is that you set up a particular amount of money and said, okay, you know what, I don't really trust you to be able to manage this million dollars that I'm giving you. So what's going to happen is we're going to set it up in a trust, and then when you turn 18 or 21, you're able to have the income off of it, but somebody else is actually set up to manage that trust and make sure that it principle doesn't degrade in order for you to be able to, because I don't trust you to make good management decisions. And so this is a similar example um, of that, which is basically not trusting the current generation to make the right management decisions. I, someone else did have a, a question. Um. We're going to start with this. Uh, well, I echo what Josh is saying in terms of good original stuff. Um, I guess I want to play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, and that has to do with how much of these, how many of these assumptions are built on 
your, the assumptions of the prevailing governance regime that we operate in, that we can trust those who are managing this trust to do the right thing in a normative way. And I don't know whether the trust as a construct is going to solve that dilemma for us. I think going back and saying, do trees have standing me, and integrating this, embedding this in the rule of law me, I'd have more trust in that if we, rather than the me these mechanisms, because if you check down this list, you could set up a common asset trust in a, in a place that doesn't, that doesn't have the environmental stewardship, but they're collective they derive a collective ownership over, let's say, our groundwaters, and make decisions regarding, uh, let's say, revenue generation, and sell off in order to rob Peter to pay Paul in order to make ends meet, let's say, or lack an environmental ethos like they may have had in China um, in revert, you know, re-engineering the Yangtze rivers. Uh, so how does, where does the normative basis of this, that we can ensure that this mechanism actually leads to the kind of sustainability that you're looking for? It seems to me that it's... It's, it's a piece that I definitely skipped over in the presentation for the sake of kind of shifting it down, but one of the main um, things popping up in literature is that you can't predetermine the mechanism. Each, each particular situation and each particular location is, going to, is distinct. Um, and so you're, I think you hit it right on the head, which is like you can't, this isn't a solution everywhere. Um, this, is, this was more of a thought experiment of kind of saying that this particular mechanism is, can be used to kind of institutionalize this, but that whatever the history of a particular place and the current, um, I guess it, it starts to get into a question of like, who are the users of a particular resource? What is their historic relationship with that resource? Um, what are the characteristics of that particular resource and kind of how has that been used over time? Then what is the larger global setting which it fit, where that interacts with other kind of neighboring resources uh, and then also other political um, and economic situations? Only once we kind of have that larger context can we kind of determine like, oh, this may work or may not, but it's going to be very situation specific. And that's what a lot of the, a lot of the literature is talking about very specifically is that you can't apply one model everywhere at all. That's, it can't be done. And so I, I shortchanged the conversation by putting this out here like this. But I felt like it was for prompting these types of That's discussions. Good. That's good. Uh, I believe that we had one over here. Um, I'm, I'm wondering that in this, there's, there's some transdisciplinary research um, that comes up in bio, medical bioethics. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called about advanced directives. So it says that if certain triggers happen, um, you know, certain um, rules and regulations of how you want to be treated go into effect. And I'm thinking Beecham and Childress did, did some very, very early stuff on this, but it's moved on. It's, you know, their stuff is mostly about autonomy and, and that. But um, especially if you look at advanced directives, which have been used for end of life care, but also they, um, and I'm out of the discipline now, so um, if, for instance, mentally ill people, if they ha have a schizophrenic fit, you know, how do they want to be treated under those certain conditions if such and such happens? So that is a continuous um, advanced directive as opposed to an end of life advanced directive. And I'm wondering if some of that uh, conceptual literature might help with some of these, um, you know, because alien in, in, blah, 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 alienability <laughs> is it's a very very rigid context, and and how can we even perceive of how to treat things in the future? I mean, we can use things like health as a standard, or, you know, but even what do we mean by environmental health and things like that? So I don't know if that's no, I mean, it was triggering I, a lot of things from a, another life. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have any background in what you're talking about. I wish I could say I understood everything you said. That's not true. But I did. Uh, that does sound very interesting. I think that would be. Let's chat a little bit after. Next week. I have to go in the <laughs> I'll track you down. Okay. Cool. Please. I think in general the problems with rights is that my rights are only so valuable as other people perceive them to be valuable. So in trying to like understand like. Your right to, like, for example, like my right to believe in God is only so valuable as other people 
engage in the, my right to practice in a way that would enhance my belief in God, and that's why we have freedom of religion. But none of that matters unless other people think it matters. So in this case, so in this case, if no one perceives nature as to be valuable, it's not valuable, because because then there would be no right to protect it. So like you have to be able to convince other people that it's valuable. Yeah, but I mean, isn't it the fact that we're bumping up the you know these ecological limits that makes them appear more valuable? So that I think isn't that what generates the sort of inevitability yeah. that you're talking about the natural emergence? And yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead. No. And say so, like all these things may be valuable, and like you may be right that like if we don't do certain things and we don't protect certain like amounts of property, bad things will happen. But if other people don't care that bad things will happen. It doesn't matter because everything's based on a human perception of what is valuable. You can only access things in a way that is created by a large group of people. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of to build on that, you know, the people who might be very specifically causing a problem, you know, going back to your river example, the, the person who perceives the problem of the river pollution are the people downstream who might not have a lot of power. They might have a lot of value for clean water because they fish. But they don't have the power necessarily to stop you know, the factory, whereas the people in the factory might have the power because they generate a lot of wealth from their factory production. Um, but they don't have the value in the clean water because the clean water, the presence or the absence of clean water, is something that they use. And so you have kind of a differential. Um, you know, the power and the value there are not necessarily invested in the same people. Sure. Just historically, I'm kind of at you know, in the 70s, 60s, you can come in crap your iron and put it over, and then they can't. I know Matt has something, and then I want to return to uh, Bob, Bob's final question. I just had a, I wanted to respond to a few different comments. One was, again, pointing out, you use the term in inevitability or something like that uh, as sort of this idea of an emergence mm -hmm. of a commons, and emergence is another theme that's often used like in, in complexity and it it seems like there's a, a useful lens there to apply somehow to how how some of these trusts or whatever that uh, structure ends up looking like um, how they could emerge uh, over time I don't I don't I guess I don't understand fully the the relationship to private property um, you had the one slide that was had uh, efficiency and then you know like Gary pointed out earlier you had commons kind of in two separate areas um, and my understanding of a lot of the history over time uh, with the enclosure movement and, and it's still going on I mean in my mind you to ensure sustainability I would agree you, you sort of need these different types of rights or however you want to characterize it um, a cultural embedded understanding of the needs of future generations, of the needs of nature, of uh, the needs of current generations collectively, all sort of existing, right? But um, going forward to, to achieve sort of a sustainability, you have a situation where even now you have what I would feel like the status quo is kind of what the pre-existing status was the commons and then over time you had this this private property regime and it's still going on sort of in closing and so on so i just wanted to better understand what you were getting at with this idea of going from private property into a common um, more common collective ownership it still seems to me that it's not so much about having or needing to move through a private property system. It's about recognizing, perhaps inspired by these limitations, like you're saying, recognizing that there still are unclaimed open access that should be or could be commons um, that have that are being threatened by this this private property cultural thing. So that it's not it's not having to go through one to the other, and I just wanted to understand that better. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think the, um, the two parts of it would be, for me, are the recognition that a lot of things are currently held as private property, so that was the kind of 
movement was that um, this was showing very specifically in the case of groundwater where we did allow specific um, absolute property rights and then how those shift, how we had to move back from that particular um, model of private property rights in the face of ecological scarcity. So it wasn't saying that, uh, basically I was trying to show, and I, I think the graphics is pretty crude and didn't do a good job of doing this, but the idea is that over time we've gotten to a place of respecting private property rights, but that then that is actually going to shift. I wasn't necessarily making any claim about what we have to go through as a society to get to the private property rights. It's kind of taken as if that's the current situation of private property rights, which is in a lot of places, then what is the next step? Is that, Does that the end uh, or the kind of like the fait accompli of property rights to kind of maximize efficiency? Um, the second um, piece that you brought up, I think it's really important, and now I forgot what it was. <laughs> uh, and I have the idea of reclaiming actual common common rights that um, have. Oh yeah, no, I think you brought up a good point, which is that some of the some of the examples that I brought up, which is our presumptive rights, are not actually private property rights at all, and they actually are unclaimed commons. Um, so then I think you're right that that is ineffective. That's ineffective at relaying that information because you bring up a good point that the air doesn't actually exist as private property right now and we've been moving it to commons. So there's two parallel ways of getting there. So I, I think that, that I should probably explain that better. That's a good point. Bob, sorry to keep you waiting. I remember the discussion about uh, when Peter Barnes was here uh, and uh, he was talking about a small committee that would determine stuff. So when I look at your list up there, I look at number two and number four. You see a small number of managers and then I see reduces political vulnerability. Uh, and I see them as somewhat contradictory, so I'm uh, responding to that. But uh, let me talk about the commons thing. You claimed, I think in your graph, that the Abenaki the indigenous folks basically had a common system here that was really working, and this was for some scarce resource. And I guess I'm asking if that's really so. My uh, jaundiced view of the world is that everybody starts out as an individualist when they bump into other people or the other limits that they start thinking about cooperation or more. And, uh, and furthermore, didn't uh, indigenous North Americans extinct a number of large mammals and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I don't actually say. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't actually know if I said all that about uh, well, no, indigenous I, Those are all cultures. my ways of saying, did the Abenakis really have a commons in the sense that we're talking about on that? That's what I'm asking. Uh, yeah, so... Um, a managerial scheme for economists and what we're talking about now. Uh, the answer would be no. And I would... For water. Yeah. Do so, you really manage groundwater? No, I'm saying for water. Okay. So, the, and I think that this is an important distinction, which is, it's why I kind of drew com commons in two places. Um, when commons emerge from open access, it's basically a group of individuals who get together and recognize that the current way that they're doing things where everybody can do whatever they want isn't quite working, so they start developing norms and rules to govern their behavior with respect to a particular aspect of uh, property, so a particular benefit stream. So uh, I don't know if I said a whole lot about how thriving their culture was. I, I don't know a lot about the Abenakis. They existed here, but I didn't do any anthropology studies. Um, but the, the recognition was that they developed a series of um, norms and values around their use of the groundwater that didn't, was not private property rights, per se. And so then the, uh, the claim of Demzev, he, he uses a different, tra uh, different group, which is actually in the Midwest, specifically around beaver trapping, but it was that their particular relationship to the resource, when confronted with uh, a new market, which is that beaver pelts would be more uh, valuable, decided, oh, shoot, we really like this private property business because I'm going to be able to maximize my returns. And so then, therefore, they shifted towards private property rights from what had previously been more of a, um, a common property regime. Does that, I, I don't know whether or not they were, they had specific councils that were meeting and saying, you get this much groundwater and you get this much groundwater. I would say my guess is that groundwater never became scarce. There was always enough for all possible uses. It never made any sense. But if you look at other things, like in a lot of cultures, for hunting rights and stuff, they would develop <coughs> real rigid rules and norms about what you could and couldn't do. Maybe a protected area you could never hunt yeah. in, or certain times you couldn't do things. Mm -hmm. And those help to protect resources. There's tons of cases where that's been well established. Yeah. So I think we have time for one, two questions. Yeah. So, so one of the critiques is, well, 
What's wrong with the way that the government manages these resources now, and why do we need this, which addresses what Chris was talking about, why do we need this, this new mechanism? Um, and, and I think that relates somewhat, if you could talk about what Eric brought up, which is that the, the, um, the, you know, the, the economic actors have, can use their financial power to influence government. Um, so why, why can't we just leave it with the Agency of Natural Resources and let them do it? Well, um, I happen to be studying the Agency of Natural Resources right now. <laughs> um, the, the main argument against leaving it in public hands is that the, based on the political whims of the current generation about what's important or not important is going to determine the impact that uh, government policy has on any particular resource. So for example, right now, the current governor is very, um, very interested in renewable energy, specifically uh, wind energy. And so then most permits for new wind projects are going through and they're being pushed through and the ones that permit them would be the Agency of Natural Resources. The construction of um, wind turbines has an effect on surrounding groundwater and usually these are done at high elevation so the impact will be down, down elevation. Now, with the, right now, because that's such an important thing for the, the state, they're pushing a lot of these projects through. If there is a codified, the, and then uh, the folks who are in the water department basically say, well, we can't do anything, we're getting pressure in order to make sure that these permits get pushed through. So we just say, okay, this is kind of what the reaction would be. Um, so the argument of putting it into a trust that's outside of the government would be to codify very specifically there isn't a trade-off about this quality of water. There is, here is the particular ecological limit for um, groundwater uh, degradation. And so then therefore, um, you can't actually have that give and take for, for current generations. You have to negotiate with that boundary, not with which one is more important, solar or groundwater for the future. Does that explain it, or is that a bunch of hot air? <laughs> that sounds <laughs> good.